Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next installment of the Gillen Data Medical Device Innovation Webinar Series. I'll be your host today. My name is Abbas Alawala, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Gillen Data. Today, we'll be hearing from Brian Allen and Mick Fry from Minitronics Medical for a conversation on DFX, the secret weapon the best medical device companies use to expedite commercialization and gain value. We'll learn as part of this conversation what is DFX and how to leverage it to your advantage while avoiding costly pitfalls. But first, few housekeeping items and a little information on Galen data. <clears throat> uh, during, uh, during the, um, during the uh, conversation, as we're going through this, if you have any questions, you can please type those in the Q&A section available through the sidebar, either on your left or right-hand side. We'll ask those questions uh, to our guests uh, at the end, or if appropriate, I'll bring those up during our conversation. There's also some handouts on that control panel with more information on Galen data, a white paper on cloud connectivity, as well as some articles about DFX for Mellotronics. Also a reminder that a copy of this webinar will be sent to you via email. Well, a background on Galen data. Uh, Galen data is an FDA compliant cloud for medical device manufacturers. The Galen cloud provides a configurable platform for device to cloud connectivity that is compliant to FDA, HEPA, and CE mark standards. We are ISO 1345 certified, and our product on AWS is Hydro certified. Founded by seasoned medical device professionals, our goal is to make medical device cloud connectivity available to all at a fraction of cost while sharing months of development timeline. Galen Data allows medical device companies to stay medical device companies and not become IT companies. That being said, I would like to introduce our guests, Brian Allen and Mick Fry from Minitronics Medical. Welcome. Brian, let's start with you. If you can maybe provide a short bio on yourself and then also some background on kind of what Minitronics Medical does uh, and, and what, what your role is. Yeah, thank you. Brian Allen from Minitronics Medical. I'm an engineering director. At Minitronics Medical, we provide manufacturing and product development services for class two and class three medical devices. We specialize in four primary areas, optics, fluids, RF, which includes RF, PFA, electroporation, and we've dabbled a little bit in plasma, and then stimulation and wearables. The team I'm working on uh, supports the, stim, the stimulation and wearables section of the business. Um, myself, I've been in medical device now for closing on 15 years, was in the defense industry prior to that, in a variety of roles from engineering, project management, uh, operations, R&D. Right now, my team is, is supporting the product development from anywhere from initial product development through commercialization, initial commercialization of a product. Well, thanks for that background, man. Mick, maybe you can do the same thing, short background on yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Mick Fry. I'm a senior principal product engineer here at Minitronics Medical. I've been here about seven years. I've got uh, 30 plus years in manufacturing and operations, uh, a, a very wide variety of disciplines, everything from heavy equipment to automotive to agricultural equipment, lasers and optics, implantable, implantable medical devices. Um, I've been in med device per se since about 1996, so 28 years closing in on med device. Thanks, thanks for that context. <clears throat> so we're here to talk about design for excellence, or DFX for short. Um, many of our viewers might have heard, I certainly have, about design for manufacturing, design for cost, and so on. Uh, so Mick, let me start with you. What is DFX, and how does it differ from some of the other terms I just mentioned? Sure. So a lot of people are familiar with design for manufacturing, right? DFA, design for assembly. Um, if you take that as a mindset and apply it to all the other disciplines necessary to run an organization that designs and manufactures anything, really, um, you can call it design for sustainability, design for test, design for cost, uh, design for supply chain. It's really just a mentality and a set of tools that you apply to reduce your design, to optimize it, so that you can win organizationally, not just treat DFM as a checkbox on the way to production. So Brian, uh, Mick, Mick made some good points here, but if I'm a medical device manufacturer or OEM, why is it important to me? Like, why do I have to worry about all this other stuff, right? And then also, um, I believe a lot of our listeners are going to be from the startup community or early stage companies. So maybe put on an investor lens as well and see why does an investor would care about a company following the effects or not following the effects? Yeah, those are really good questions. I would say for an OEM, large or small, 
VFX is really an effective tool to mitigate and eliminate risk for development timelines and cost. And so from a, from a high level, if you're able to reduce complexity and think about the, the end up front and, and pull in a cross-functional team to really look at how the products can be manufactured, used, how you're gonna procure components, you start to, again, reduce that complexity. And so if you think about it, if you have fewer parts to buy, that's less cost. If you that's fewer parts to inspect, that's fewer items to go wrong when you go to assemble and, and test a device. And so it just kind of trickles down. So really it's, it's, it's mitigating and eliminate risk through the development cycle, decreasing that time, decreasing the overall cost to develop a medical device product. And for investors, whether that's a large OEM interested in, in procuring a startup, or if that's say someone that's looking at it from a venture capital perspective, it reduces risk relative to getting a return on their investment. So if you, if you have a simpler device, the supply chain is stable, the manufacturing processes are stable, it's been demonstrated to be a product that's usable, it's much easier to demonstrate how you can, how you can achieve a given production cost target, as well as how you can grow your revenue. And that translates the ability to achieve your a business objectives, which really, if someone's looking to invest, they're looking at how real is this company. It's easy to put together a PowerPoint and say, hey, yes, it's manufacturable. But if you can articulate that you understand the, the amount of time it takes to build a product, what your, what your um, yield is, you understand what are the, the risks, how you're mitigating them. And, and to put it in perspective, I think there was an article this past fall that McKinsey put out that talked about how the valuation of companies now is more dependent upon your margin than it is just on pure growth. And really what that's going after is if you if you have a product and you're able to demonstrate that it's profitable, it's a way of demonstrating that you put some effort into these things versus just coming up with something that you can go sell, but maybe isn't as, as productive from a financial perspective. Well, that's a great information. Thanks about that. So Mick, let me ask you this. Uh, as Brian mentioned, is something you want to think across uh, the life cycle, right? So again, if I'm an OEM and I have a idea uh, of a product, or I may be in a, in a kind of proof of concept phase, or I may be towards you know manufacturability, or, or at least go to market. Like when do I think in that product timeline from concept to design? When does one start thinking about the FX? Right. Uh, so the answer is the earlier the better, right? Um, I referenced uh, some people regarding it as a checkbox that you've checked just before you go to production, and that's not the way to do it. It's oftentimes far too late. Um, the earlier you adopt the mindset and the tools of design for excellence, the better you are. Uh, this graphic shows a typical product development timeline. Um, we like to couch it in you know, medical device because that's the business we're in, but really you can apply it to any industry. Um, Typical timeline looks like this, often the green side uh, concept architecture. You spend some time in design, and then you go ahead and you start building things in smaller volume, ramping up to larger volume. And this is the red phase where the wheels sort of fall off the bus, right? You start to see all the sources of normal manufacturing variation that are inherent in your design that are impediments to you scaling up, to ramping up to the intended volume that you want to get to. So there's a lot of change orders, there's a lot of revisions. Sometimes you do, you know, after the fact, um, tolerance changes to make parts fit together. Um, and it's it's a trying time. It can be a struggle to get to higher volumes. With a concurrent engineering timeline, using the, the tools of Design for Excellent, you can expand the concept architecture phase when you're thinking about how you're going to develop and design this product and rethinking it, re-spinning it, really iterating the design as many times as possible to reduce it to its simplest elements and all the factors considered, manufacturing, cost, uh, maintenance, quality, to make sure you're launching with the best, most robust, most scalable design possible. And yes, it expands the, the beginning phases. Typically, you end up reaching your milestones of production volume earlier than you do if you delay those decisions and go through your typical firefighting and change order uh, ramp up phase. Well, I mean, as, as a software leader and a product owner, I can kind of already see. So we do this in software a lot, which is which is an agile process. How to kind of you know figure out the kinks before we go to market, uh, but do this in a in a in a hardware design has, has always been a a challenge. Uh, so it seems like this mm -hmm. is kind of 
is, is moving towards that. So let me, you know, I can see a lot of uh, lot of benefits already. Uh, kind of have that on the slide. You know, stable production half time is one. Uh, I think Brian said one on on cost. But what other benefits um, do you have? Do, do you get by using this kind of tool sets and the DFX approach? Well, typically you can avoid some of the firefighting and change orders that occur during that that scale up, that ramp that I, I spoke of. Um, you can have a more stable, more consistent product with higher quality and can avoid some of the pitfalls um, with product failures uh, kind of after the fact, after you've already sent it off in, into production. So let me, let, let me flip the question a little bit. Um, what happens if I don't use, use DFX at all? Or if I use it as, as more of a checkbox or incorrectly, is there, is there, let's say I'm in a, in a process of building, is there a time that I should not bring DFX in? Or is, is once I start yeah. the concept product, am I yeah. too late uh, to use DFX? You can, in, in med device, we see this a lot because sometimes <clears throat> medical device development is really motivated by short term goals, right? You have to, show safety and effectivity of your device design and then submit that to regulating bodies for acceptance and entry into the market and that's kind of a, a short timeline in some people's mind and they rush to that goal thinking that's the finish line and it's really not and they might go together uh, they might go to market with a design that's sort of glued together or maybe built in a lab by very uh, precise people who can build one or two, but really aren't thinking, how do you build 10,000? How do you build 100,000? And minimize all those sources of variations so that every single one works. Um, glue is my four letter word. I, I tease a lot of our customers sometimes. I say, we're not gonna glue this together. Glue is a four letter word. We're gonna avoid it at all costs. Um, what we see over and over is in the rush to prove safety, and efficacy, things, uh, glue, which is easy to reach for and go stick parts together, are used that aren't scalable later on in production. And what can happen is you end up hamstringing your ability to scale up later on because you've glued something together and you're waiting for epoxy to dry. Maybe you have clamping fixtures where you're holding two parts together and you're looking at a clock saying, well, it's got to cure for three hours or maybe even 24 hours, right? So now when you think about scaling that up, you have to have tens or maybe even hundreds of those fixtures to clamp parts together and then someone's got to be watching the clock to know you know first in first out which ones are done which ones are not done done and the opportunity, the opportunity for an escape or a escape failure, or failure is greatly magnified that is all great info uh, but maybe to contextualize this i mean you gave some examples about the glue and the clamping but maybe if you can give me a, a either a project that you worked on or or some some you know more concrete examples examples of kind of the benefits uh, that you saw as a result of using the FX or announcements that were made uh, or cost savings timeline savings whatever that was uh, on that project sure. how do we project sure. one we have several we worked on uh, several uh, wearable um, medical devices recently that were developed in a laboratory, some in university settings, where very smart engineers and physicists and um, doctors even come up with an idea or a therapy and they clue something together and it works on the bench, right? And they go, aha, we're ready to go to market. Um, <clears throat> we typically take that design and we scrutinize it. Um, we go through and we simplify it and then we push that design towards scalable industrial equipment platforms that we have in-house for say welding plastic enclosures around a, a circuit board combination or using um, most notably net shape manufacturing methods to create the geometries that you need rather than the lego style approach where you add brick a to brick b to brick c to brick d you would mold the whole part in one shot and then maybe use sub disciplines of over molding or insert molding, a net shape process, things like, like I said, injection molding, maybe casting, die cutting, metal injection molding, so that once a tool is built, all the parts that are made on that tool are essentially the same within tolerances that are typically an order of magnitude smaller than if you're building individual parts and adding them together, A, B, C, and D. Yeah, well, one thing I'd add to that is, as you, as you describe it too, 
you decrease the amount of parts. It, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but we have one customer that came in and had a bill of material that was 83 items. When uh, Mick and a few others were done, they reduced that down to 23 items. So that's a fraction of the parts that you need to procure. You eliminated a number of vendors, which you would have to qualify and manage over the life cycle of a, of a product. And so it really is a, a powerful tool that has legs much beyond just the, the simplification of the design itself. Yeah, I like to say it has a systemic effect on your organization, right? If you think about taking on a project that's got 83 parts, that means you have 83 sets of engineering drawings to control and to release, and maybe uh, ECO later on. You've got 83 separate discrete components you have to get on order in some quantity, receive, inspect, material move out to the line, handle, conduct quality operations on, and then assemble them, right? And if you can reduce that to 23, think about the systemic effect on your business as a whole. It's an order of magnitude simpler. Yeah, that makes sense. But maybe I want to come back to that, uh, go back to kind of the original you know, aspect of it. If I am a startup, and I know there's, there's a range of startups, but if I'm an early stage startup, and my goal is twofold, either to prove that the device works, um, whether that be safety, efficacy, whatever that is, and also to raise money, because I need to get to a platform quickly uh, to get, uh, get to a point where I can raise more money and then you know, uh, do more with it. Is there elements of DFX that can apply uh, in that very, very, very early stage, or is it best to kind of you know, prototype and, and quickly put together something uh, and then get into a more uh, durable DFX process, or would you advise not doing that kind of stuff? Yeah, I, I would first consider the patients you're trying to affect, right? What's your patient population? What's that higher goal? I want to reach 50,000 patients out there in the world that suffer from this particular malady. Do I want to rush to market and never really penetrate that patient population? Do I want to go off too early and just show it's safe and effective, but never be able to scale up? So that kind of is where I start from, and I counsel our customers to start from to think about that patient population, because that's really in med device, that's our highest goal, right? We want to serve the patients, right? And then I use very simply a, a set of four tenants when I apply it. Um, number one, basically just minimize the total number of parts in your design. And I measure those parts two different ways, design parts and used parts. So if you consider like just a toy car, right? Toy companies are really good at this. A toy car, maybe with a plastic shell body, two axles and four wheels. If we count those parts, you could say, well, there's one body, there's one axle and one wheel that's designed. There are three design parts. There are four wheels that are used and there's two axles and then the body. So there's seven total used parts. And if you leapfrog that yet again, you might think, well, I can really mold those wheels right onto the axles. So I can get one part that is you know, essentially net shape manufactured once, I'm gonna use it twice, and then I have the car body and I snap that on. So I'm down to two design parts used three times, right? So that's kind of very simplistic view of how I measure it. Secondly, the second discipline is to just ruthlessly eliminate adhesives and threaded fasteners. Not that they don't have their application, sometimes they do, but if the adhesive requires uh, a cure or a drying time, it is subject to variation and application. You can put too much, you can put not enough, you can put it in the wrong place, right? So if you can eliminate the glue altogether and use a more stable process like welding or net shape manufacturing, snap fits, um, other methods, you're, you're gonna be far ahead. Threaded fasteners have their application also, but we need to be particularly careful with how many we use, uh, the variation of those threaded fasteners, and then how they're attached to the other parts. Sometimes in plastics, we use inserts and they're prone to failure, right? Uh, the third kind of tenet I use is try to design your device to fabricate as many of those parts using net shape processes as possible, right? Um, you can CNC machine aluminum really cheap and kind of effectively today to precise tolerances. There are CNC machining centers that'll hold 50 millionths, right, of tolerance. But if you think about reaching that patient population again and building significant volumes of those parts that are machined, 
whether you're a fan of Deming or Duran, SPC becomes a nightmare when you're trying to manage all of those critical dimensions, features, and tolerances on a machine part versus one that maybe is fabricated using a net shape process. So molded, casted, uh, die cut, or metal injection molded uh, are gonna be much more repeatable over time and the total variation for the product life cycle is gonna be minimized. Lastly, I would say, try to push your design towards methods of assembly of those parts that are toward industrial processes and automation platforms, right? So rather than an operator gluing parts together, um, we have on our floor a fusion welding platform that actually takes plastic part A and plastic part B and melts them together and then presses them and holds them in a very rapid manner in a very controllable and repeatable fashion and no one's waiting for glue to dry. So that's kind of one example of how I practice DFM, DFX. Yeah, I think of Boston and getting back to the, <clears throat> the part of the example where you're wondering about startups. You know, I don't, the, the reasons for doing it don't necessarily change from a startup to a, a large OEM, but the startups feel this pressure to artificially, as, as Mick said, get to an end state. Yet, I, it's important not to think about using DFX as a lengthening of the process. In the end, I, I think that first, that second diagram that was shown shows how it actually decreases it. It can seem a little bit of pain, a little bit painful up front as you're going through some of that concepts and iterating in the early stages in development, but all of that saves you time on the back end. So exactly. the, the amount of times that we we work with customers that come in and, and have a product and maybe they're ready to go through and do verification testing. Well, the amount of time we spend fixing fixing bugs or corrections on drawings in that in that later stage, say pre-DV, pre-verification stage, is greatly increased when they haven't taken this use use this type of methodology. So if you if you are thinking about it more up front, your overall timeline should decrease. So it's really an accelerator to get to market. And so that's the, what I would encourage people to to kind of reframe their thinking on is, is DFX should accelerate as opposed to lengthen, and then the end product should be should should be a better better one. I know I agree. We we had a customer that we work with, and a mutual customer of one of the uh, partners here, uh, and they spent almost six nine months to get to that kind of prototype phase uh, for for ability to raise money and 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 go do some safety and efficacy evaluation. And once they did it, they didn't follow any DFX. They did it, and then they decided, okay, now how do I scale? And they realized that a lot of the design elements just not possible that to manufacture at scale. And they had to go in a redesign phase, which took them 2x longer and 4x, I believe, the cost of the original one. Mm -hmm. exactly. Hardly time, um, and it, they had to do a lot of rework uh, on on the design, the concept, the software, everything, because the hardware. I mean, there's a lot of stuff uh, that they had to yeah. redo. Uh, and so and it gets more expensive. The farther down that timeline you get, the more expensive change becomes, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and the aspect too, if you're if you're a startup working with investors, going back and asking for more funds later later in later stages of development also is more painful. You know, the the VCs are going to take a little bit bigger chunk of the meat the later in the stage you're coming back if you're not able to execute in a in a predictable fashion. And and so being able to get through a development process in a more predictable fashion is also really important for people that are trying to maintain their equity positions. Agree. So Brian, we talked about uh, kind of how DFX helps you, and you know, Mick listed out a, a plethora of benefits and, and the reasons to do it. So let me change a little bit and say, you know, you're here representing Minotronic. So how does Minotronic specifically deliver those benefits, and then kind of essentially what makes you qualified or position uh, to do that? Yeah, that's a really, another really good question. I'd say one of the, we have a couple different advantages. One of them being it's just our, our team. You know, we have people that have come from a lot of different industries. They've come from large OEMs, startups. And so we have people that have been on the, on the OE, in the OEM shoes. They've developed a product in that environment, either for investors or for a, the, the company they work for as well as Minitronics has developed some of their own products. So we have a full understanding of that life cycle. We appreciate the, the challenges of, of getting a submission through the FDA. And so I think we, we bring that really strong diversity of perspective to the mix. 
the other thing that I would say somewhat uniquely positions us is we spend a lot of time looking at doing our development and using processes during those prototyping stages that will lend themselves to our desired manufacturing process. And so what I, what I mean by that, going after some of the things that Mix uh, touched on earlier, if we are doing a, a prototype development and we, and we make that first prototype and we use an SLA process, but in the end, we would like to be able to weld the plastics together. Or if we're using a material that you can't weld, then you start leaning towards that gluing and that screwing in order to, to assemble it and work it through the manufacturing process at least to get that first one developed well all of a sudden you have you have pressures on your on your time and your in your budget from investors and then you're trying to figure out well now how do i just get this thing through verification and submit it well by the time you've gone that far your ability to to go back and and leverage um processes and materials that are going to be much more successful in a higher volume manufacturing environment is grossly limited at least it's going to cost a lot more to get there and take more time so I would say one of the biggest things we do is think about the method of manufacture up front so that we are designing products that are, are lending themselves to be manufactured using the manufacturing processes that we've already invested in so that we know once it gets to that commercial stage, we're gonna be able to build it using, using methods and materials and, and processes in which we're familiar. Right, we call it a holistic prototyping methodology, right? Um, we're going to prototype it quickly. We're going to use the tools of the trade. 3D printers are great right now, right? You can 3D print anything. Unfortunately, you can 3D print things that don't lend themselves to later, you know, uh, injection molding. Um, but if you holistically prototype, that means you're going to prototype it in the way you intend to mass produce it in, right? So we're going to 3D print it maybe using uh, SLS or SLA, but then we're going to thermoform it or we're going to stake it or we're going to weld it. Uh, in the method that we intend to manufacture it later on, we can prove out um, as early as possible the geometries and, and resins and material choices and the form fit function, as well as safety and efficacy of the device itself. Thank, thanks, Brian, Mick, on that. Um, there's some quite a few of questions coming in, so maybe let's move on to kind of a Q&A phase. Uh, just a note to our listeners, uh, if you'd like to ask Brian and Meg a question, please type it in the Q&A section on the sidebar. It's either on the left or right. Uh, we'll try to get as many as questions as possible on air. Uh, and for the questions we cannot get to, we'll have Brian and Meg answer those via email. Um, so we'll get you to your questions answered one way or the other. So don't hesitate to ask those questions. Um, let me start with these uh, that came in. Um, so the first question says, my design team doesn't think about DFX as a design stage. What does the collaboration look like at that stage? From the napkin idea to prototyping, tell me more about, there's a lot of questions here, so I'm going to read it slowly. Tell me more about what the design team can expect. Uh, do they come to your facility? Brian um, or Mick, who wants to take that question? Yeah, what does it look like? Well, I'm going to be honest here, it's messy. Right. The best cooks are the messiest cooks, in my opinion. And sometimes in the beginning, uh, it can be a little bit of a power struggle, a little bit of uh, melee, uh, particularly between like the software people, the circuit board, the electric uh, electrical people and the mechanical guys, because sometimes you have to make concessions on both sides. Um, we tend to work in silos. Um, I can remember one product we worked on recently where um, the electrical engineering team Pretty much thought they were done hey circuit board's done it's a square it's this big it's this thick all the parts are there and the mechanical team said wait we can't make this thing hermetically sealed we want to change how we put this together mechanically we want to injection mold this thing and actually incorporate it into the, the flexible resin we're using in order to do that to get a mechanical bond on that you know teflon like uh, material that flex circuits are made of we perforated the circuit board we said hey electrical guys what if we put holes here, here, and here so that we can flow plastic resin through that part and we can get a, a mechanical bond around it and truly make it waterproof, watertight, life-proof, we like to say, right? Because these are medical devices that are intended to be worn on the skin or on the body. Um, that's blasphemy to an electrical engineer sometimes, right? They're done. They don't want to back up and change something. So it does get a little messy. There's some you know, arm wrestling to be done. Uh, I believe firmly that iron sharpens iron. And 
the team as a whole starts to gel and the conversation ebbs and flows one direction or another, you come up with solutions that solve problems for all the members, not just one particular discipline or one group in particular. Um, it looks very messy in the beginning. I'm not gonna lie, that concept architecture phase in the beginning where you're trying things, you're building things, you're failing fast, uh, does look like you're kind of going in circles sometimes. The benefits are huge because you find all the solutions that aren't gonna work before you find the ones that are gonna work. And it's a lot of effort. It's a, a discipline to go through it. It's worth it in, in my opinion. Yeah, and I would say for, for our prospective customers, what that might look like to them is if we have a customer that we're engaging with and want us to work, regardless of the, the stage of development, oftentimes what we'll talk about doing if they have some, call it prior art or some prior design prototype or something that they think is relatively mature, we'll offer to do a gap analysis. And one of the first things we'll do is pull in a team to look at what they have and provide recommendations. And so again, what that would look like for a customer is we'd be pulling in someone like Mick, we'd be pulling in people from our process development team, we'd be pulling people in from supply chain or supplier quality group. And we can do everything from looking at the looking at the manufacturing process as they have it ideated. It could be looking at the prints that they have, the supply chain, some of it's getting into component selection. You know, if you're working with a an IC and there's there's a, a uh, you know a new version coming out that's going to be changing which is going to result in people having to update software or firmware to to account for that you know those are things that if you're not, if you're not looking ahead or if you're not living in that world you might not see and so we're going to try to bring that to the table for our customers and then lay out the options because there are there are cases where they have gotten pretty far down the development cycle and starting over doesn't make practical sense so we can put it into a couple buckets of what do you do now versus what do you do in the next generation that might be another advantage that customers have coming to Minitronics. Since we cover that full life cycle, we can handle the, the developing the product from the ground up. But also if someone's coming in and they have a product and they're looking at a next generation, we can do those sustaining activities, next gen design. And again, the, the big thing you can expect is we're gonna pull in a, a cross disciplinary team to make sure we're looking at it from multiple different perspectives. Yeah, I think the keyword there is cross disciplinary, right? So make sure you, you look at from every angle possible. All right, so next question that came in says, um, I think this is in reference to the example you gave, Mick, uh, going from 83 to 23. The question is, do you approach minimizing the bill of materials length with off-the-shelf components that have been previously tested first? Or, or I guess that's a question, but I'm assuming it's in relation to maybe it's at off-the-shelf components or do you design those? Absolutely, where it's applicable. If there's an off-the-shelf component that satisfies the requirements, uh, fits inside the design, uh, yeah, we would absolutely consider that. Yeah, I think one thing to add, you, you used a really key word there, Mick, which was requirements. And one of the first things we'll talk to a customer on in that respect is look at the requirements, and that's where a lot of it starts. And in addition to looking at the physical embodiment of an idea, it can really start with the requirements architecture. And again, we've had customers that have come in with with 100 plus high level system requirements and our goal will be to reduce that down and reduce the number of testable requirements you have because it's less less verification uh, and, and it just simplifies both the the development process but then it also provides a a lot of times will provide a level of freedom down the road it's much easier to add or change a feature if there isn't uh it, call it an overly constrained requirement, which was intended for that specific embodiment of the, of, the, of the product. And so by reducing requirements, it provides design team more freedom in a, in a larger envelope in, in which to, to operate. And I think we can bring a perspective to that because a lot of times startup companies are very young. Um, the personnel are very young. Sometimes they come right out of university. Uh, we worked on projects that literally were a senior design project at university and they wanna launch it. Well, they don't know what they don't know. And they think the requirements are maybe this big and they're not. And they're gonna you know, head for a, a pitfall here somewhere. We can sort of educate them and help them see what we see because we've been down that road before. 29 years in the business, Minitronics Medical has worked on a lot of different projects and we can kind of uh, help guide uh, startup companies through that 
uh, requirements phase and plan for uh, what's going to be realistic, what they really need, not just what they think they need given their age and experience level. As we say, requirement is a king. All right, next question. As a CDMO organization, when you save manufacturing time and costs, once the design is transferred to the manufacturing, how do you allocate the cost savings realized between your organization and the client? That's an interesting question. Well, that, yeah, it's a really good question. And, and really, our, our goal isn't to try to just grow our margins through that activity. I mean, the, the natural reality is um, a lot of our most successful customers will likely be procured by someone larger. And, and part of our motivation is to make sure that we have a good, effective product and cost-effective manufacturing process going to commercial production because, A, then it's going to grow more. It's going to help more patients which is that's why we're in this business. We could be in any, any, any sort of business, but we're a medical device for a reason. And, and that translates in the ability to, to, to think about how we're engaging in that process. And, and again, our, if, we, if we focus on just growing our own margin and say we're working with a, a startup, well, B, larger company comes in, say it's a Boston Scientific or a Medtronic, they're educated enough to know whether or not the cost of that product matches up with what really should go into it. And if, if they think our, our margin's too high, that just creates an incentive for them to say, all right, well, we're gonna redesign it. Say if we didn't think about the FX, we're gonna redesign it. And while we redes redesign it, since we can take 40% of the cost out, we might as well vertically integrate it at the same time. So for us, in order to, in, in order to invest in this, it's, it, part of it is to make it stickier. We have several, several programs where the, the owner of the product has changed three, four or five times and it's still being manufactured at, at Minitronics Medical. That doesn't happen if you don't put some effort into your DFX because it's too easy to take the cost out for people that don't. And, and so I, I, that's kind of the way, way I look at it. It's not really a tool for us to, to, to grow our own independent margin. It's really to increase sales and, and create value for, for our customers and, and their investors. And I think it's important to note that um, by doing these uh, DFM, DFX approaches to a design early, um, you improve the value proposition of your startup company. And venture capital or uh, companies that might acquire your company are becoming aware of these kind of efforts and they can sort out today products that we kind of fly by night built on a shoestring and might not ever scale. And those that really are built for the long haul are going to reach the patient population they've targeted and are going to provide a return for those investors. Let me kind of, as a good segue into the next question that came in. Um, we talk a lot about uh, kind of startups um, and, and startups are getting acquired, but startups needing this. Uh, so they're both value proposition properly and then they can go to, go to market faster. But maybe if you take an OEM, a larger, larger OEM like a Medtronic, a Boston Scientific, uh, that may not be doing this at the design stage. Are there any unique challenges or opportunities uh, for bigger companies uh, that uh, that are different from maybe a startup or a small organization? Yeah, I'd maybe start with um, a, a lot of your larger companies are thinking about this. The the, ch the challenge that 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 I I see, and one of the things that they kind of need to take a step back, particularly if they're going to engage someone like this, because we'll, we'll, we'll develop products for a, a large OEM as well, is they tend to think about it in the lens through which they view the world. And they've developed their own manufacturing processes, their own design processes, their own standard operating procedures a certain way. I think one of the big dangers you have with a, with a large OEM engaging someone like us is they might come with way too many requirements. They're basically telling you what to do and how to do it. Well, that may not be the best way. And so one of the luxuries we have, having worked with so many different customers and so many different products, we bring a lot of unique perspectives to that. So for the OEM, I think it's a challenge in taking a step back, opening up their, their thought to a, a broader perspective and letting us pr present something, because it may be that we can arrive at a solution that's a little bit more elegant based on bringing some different ideas to the table. Uh, next question that came in says, have you noticed for any additional IP generation using the, the DFX approach versus the traditional approach? Interesting question. Not sure. 
IP generation? Yeah, yes, question. actually, absolutely. And and we have helped customers uh, uh, generate IP that they have actually patented uh, in conjunction with our um, push towards DFM, DFX. Yeah, and I think I think the one of the unique things about Minitronics compared to um, maybe some some competitors or other companies is our approach to that is pretty open. I mean, if you're if if a customer is paying us to do the work, they own the IP. Now they may generously choose to add Mick or someone else who helped come up with the idea onto the patent application, but they're the owners of it. And since they're, they're paying us to do that development work, they own it. The, the other part that gets a little bit interesting is when you start talking about the manufacturing process. Different companies take different philosophies with respect to um, controlling or managing IP. Some companies will choose to forego submitting uh, patent applications on process because you're effectively telling someone else how to manufacture it. And it's not always easy when you're looking at the end product to know how someone manufactured yeah. it. Sometimes, so sometimes it's smarter to keep it a those, secret. Yeah, sometimes those, those will say trade secrets because there's no there's no value in telling someone else how you were able to save 30% of your production costs because you found a new creative method to end up with the same end product. And so a lot of that'll be just discussion and negotiation with the customer. And we can, you know, at the end we can we can provide our recommendation, but but they own the they own the product design and, and in the end are the manufacturer of record. The next question says. When is it too early to consider human factors? And when is it too late? Uh, never and <laughs> never. never. Too early. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the way I look at it is just a matter of, of cost. Um, you, you could look at a couple examples and in, in particular, you could look at some of the larger OEMs. They've made acquisitions and they're getting a little bit more picky on, on how they make acquisitions acquisitions relative to, I'd say, DFX and inclusive of that is usability, human factors. A number of products have, have um, had great um, records of safety and efficacy, but either the ability to deploy that product, redeploy it in the body, or some other aspect of, of the utilization of the product has been a barrier to growth or, or a barrier to entry to market. So I think there's there's really there really isn't anything saying that it's too early to consider because going out and getting some of those getting some of that input from key opinion leaders early helps establish your requirements, which then trickle down into the design of the design of the product. And as far as too late, um, again, it's a matter of cost. So if someone's thinking about it late, they already have a pain point. Reimagining the either the procedure or the the function of the product in terms of usability it at least gives you choices and then you can either keep doing what you're doing and bang your head against the wall or maybe there's a pathway to to providing some investment to remove that pain point yeah with cool. respect to the too early you know it's a great time to be an engineer with 3d printers uh, being what they are and other additive manufacturing technologies you can literally design a part on your computer this afternoon hit print tomorrow morning, come in and you can fit it to somebody's body. You can see what implications that design decision has on human factors, right? It's never too early to consider human factors and it's, it's a great time to start now. Yeah, I agree with that. A um, few more questions. Um, in what circumstances would, you, would your general work for hire practice be modified? Do you ever work with a different option? I, I'm not sure I'm entirely following following the question. So the uh, question could you repeat it maybe? Yeah, mm -hmm. the question says in what circumstances would your work for hire practice uh, will be modified? Is there do you right now I'm assuming you know somebody comes with you with a set of requirements or a set of ideas mm -hmm. and you work for hire, so that's how it works. Do you ever take a different approach, maybe co-owning product or, or anything like that? Generally speaking, generally speaking, no. I mean, the Minitronics model is really our intent is to grow our business through increased uh, manufacturing operations. So we want to be because in the end, we're in the business to help people. So the more products we're manufacturing in a commercial state, the more people we're helping, and and that's our focus. So as far as say making an investment in a customer, that's not a, a typically a, a mode of operation that we that we entertain. Now, with that said, you know, as, as a customer comes to us, we're very flexible in how we engage with them. 
and and that that happens on a, on a call of a couple different levels. It may be that a customer wants to be responsible for their algorithm. All right, you can be responsible for the algorithm, and we can do a we can do another part of design, the rest of the design. It may be a customer that comes to us and they have a single use device. They want us to do the capital. There's a mechanical single use device that they're working with another partner on. We could do the system requirements for the whole thing, or we could focus just on the, the capital portion of the, the system. So in that respect, in our engagement with customers, we're really flexible. From a financial in, engagement, it's it's more a, more a service for hire and, and, and really, really looking for a partnership. And, and the, the, our intent isn't just to be someone someone writes a check to. We want to be a partner that's engaging in both the development, manufacture of the product, and then the life cycle, that full life cycle. We want to look at opportunities for next gen. How can we improve it and help them grow their business? Absolutely. I like the word partner. We always say to our customers, you know, we want to be partner for life, not a vendor for, for a day. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. a, a related question. Um, it's mentioned when collection and kind of how to work, uh, a more general question. So what are some questions that a medical device company or startup should ask during the diligence process to ensure they have selected a good design firm? Should they be looking for accreditations? They should be looking for past customers. Uh, some, some, it's kind of hard to answer that being on the chair, but what would a customer should ask you if they come to you? Yeah, I, I think all of the all of those questions are good. Um, understanding if there's is references are, are is a fine model. The other part is to learn more about the what is their product development process, or what is their commercial manufacturing process, and what are their controls. You know, are they going to invite you to their facility? Can you walk around and see it? Can you meet the people that would be developing the product? Is it a uh, is it um, and as you go through, what level of information do they provide? It's really, and I had a conversation with a, a prospective customer, it was probably about uh, six months ago, where they said, Brian, what, what I'm concerned about is that you're gonna, you're gonna bait and switch us. You're gonna tell us this, this low ball number, and then it's just gonna grow bigger. And my response to him was, um, you already told me the number you want, and we're higher than that, because that's what we think it's gonna take. If, 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 I, if I wanted to lowball you to get the business in, I would have told you what you wanna hear. But we're gonna try to tell you what we think is matches up with reality. So I think you know asking questions to get to the to the heart of their proposal. Um, some things, for example, if you're looking for a, a customer's coming in, particularly say if it's a manufacturing transfer, a lot of people come to us and they just want the unit price. Well, what are what are the things that go into that unit price? What what is the what what is the assumption around the labor? You know how many hours of labor are going into it? What's the assumption around the raw material cost? What is the what is the person assuming on yield? I can throw out a unit price, but if I don't have an understanding of what what we're assuming on some of those elements that build up into the cost of the product, the likelihood of achieving it is less, and, and the larger likelihood that you're working with someone that's providing a number in order to win the business and doesn't have a vision of how they're going to materialize the the commitment they're making with you as a partner. Okay. Um, next question came in. Let me make for you. Do you have any suggestions for selling the DFX approach to the rest of the engineering and uh, business development team? How do you evangelize the DFX in your organization? How do I evangelize it? Yeah. Um, well, I preach a lot, right? Uh, I, I tell them uh, that you're going to actually get to your intended market quicker. I show them this typical timeline versus a concurrent engineering timeline, and I, I show them case studies of projects that we've worked on here at Minitronics, but also that are generally available out there in the literature, and almost every case study that you'll read about the implementation of uh, design for excellence, design for manufacturability, will show you that it results in a more stable, more robust, higher quality product, uh, typically less cost, and gets you um, to market on time under budget. Now, if you were to just you know, quote all the parts and materials and labor for design A, and then say, well, how can you incrementally improve on that? You're going the long road. Uh, sometimes it's better to kind of aim at the hash marks if you're a bowler, right? You want to hit the pins, but you're going to aim at the short term. And by practicing the tenets of DFM, we know that reducing the number of parts, reducing the number of critical uh, features and tolerances, and using net shape manufacturing is going to get us there. And we're going to be lower cost, higher volume, more robust. Um, 
that's typically how I talk about it. I sometimes uh, edit my uh, diatribe to the, the party that we're talking to, right? Uh, financial guys versus engineering guys versus uh, project leaders, people leaders, um, people that have been around manufacturing uh, for a while. Uh, typically see value in, in what I'm saying uh, because they've experienced it also, right? We've all been on those projects that seemed like they were just headed for disaster. No matter what you did, um, things got worse and worse. So uh, we talk about the horror story sometimes uh, and try to learn from that and not repeat those same mistakes. Uh, yeah, the element that you hit on there that I think was really important was the knowing the audience because we've run into this a number of times where you're talking to maybe our product development lead or an engineer that's engaged with us first and they're going, gosh, Mick, I hear you, but you know, the, the finance person or the CEO is worried about X, Y, Z. Well, let's get them in the room because one of the nice things about DFX versus just talking about design for manufacturing, there's some element that goes into DFX that will resonate with that CEO, with the CFO. And so putting it in terms of how it's gonna benefit their concerns or address their their major is, is really a tool. I mean, it's kind of sales salesmanship 101. It, in order to be a good partner, you really need to understand understand the needs of uh, needs of your of your partner and, and how to address them best. Right. The the handouts, there's two handouts in the in the in the control panel. I have some really good information about DFX and kind of how you can use some of that uh, to also uh, kind of do this in evangelization uh, to whoever would ask that question. A um, couple more questions. Um, one is, this is a very specific one. Do you all have a preference for an assembly simulation software, uh, markups or models? So I have been uh, exposed to um, software by a company called Boothroyd Dewhurst, who sort of wrote the book, so to speak, on design for assembly, design for manufacturing. Uh, and their discipline, their approach to it is solid, it's time tested, it's proven. Um, it's a, a bit of a, a, an investment to make and uh, it's the right solution for many companies that are starting down this role and want to evangelize and make a discipline out of DFX lifestyle. It's not a fit for everyone, um, but again, you can reduce the discipline to a, sort of a short list of, look, how do you attack it um, on a small scale versus how do I implement it company wide? Um, and really, like I said before, it's it's more of a mindset than anything. Got it. And then the last question may be aimed at us, but I'll read it out. Can you please elaborate on your data monetizing capabilities and experience working with startups? Not sure about the data monetizing, but maybe experience uh, experience working with startups. Yeah, I, I think in the, I, I think you kind of hit on it, boss. This one is it does really fall in the the Galen um, a space a little bit more. So as a as a supporter of of a lot of our customers and OEMs, we're developing the medical device. If we're going to if a customer needs that cloud or data management services, we're going to partner with a group like Galen Data. And and what's really important in that in that relationship is to understand. Um, how the other entity operates in order to make it efficient as well as you know as, as we're working through it we can develop the hardware to make sure it's optimized for the given data solution as long as we're having those conversations and so i think there's an element of collaboration this kind of goes back to i think you you emphasize the cross-disciplinary piece you know if we're working with the galen data we're an extension of the same organization we're all one team working with the customer and making sure that we understand the overall requirements so the hardware supports the the firmware and supports the any of that cloud data infrastructure but uh, Abbas you, you're probably a, a lot better suited to speak to uh, speak to things on your end yeah absolutely so the modernization uh, to who asked that question uh, we do have some experiences with that but it's it's a complex problem and we'll need a whole lot more insight to kind of give you some some expertise uh, if you want to reach out to us um, uh, we're happy to have a conversation around that uh, but as Brian mentioned you no know, uh, if, if you need the cloud or, or you know, work together we definitely work together as a, as a single team uh, so that we, we hash out all the issues up front and this whole DFX approach I uh, believe those were did i miss any nope those were all the questions um that that came in 
Uh, if we didn't get to your question somehow, or if you have more questions, uh, the contact information for Brian and Mac is going to be on the screen. Um, thanks, Brian and Mac, for your time. I personally learned a lot today, um, and I hope everybody else did. And thanks again for everyone who joined, and you all have a great day ahead. Thanks for having thanks us. For having us.